the scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Please be seated. Thanks, Ed. We believe. We believe. Amen. I want to begin this morning, first of all, by congratulating Ryan and Kyle Wicks, who dethroned Mike and me from our two-year reign of terror over the annual egg toss competition. Watch out next year. This uh, bit of trivia may only be of interest to me, but looking back over my records, I noticed that I've spoken on a resurrection theme on Easter uh, 22 times over the last 30 years. Uh, the first five years of my ministry here, Glenn and I shared the pulpit, so he got some of those Easter Sundays, and I didn't. Of course, I've been away a couple of times. And then there have been a few years where I didn't want to break out of the sermon series because the subject was applicable to Easter Sunday, even though it wasn't specifically about the resurrection. But the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus is one that I never tire of telling. There are many captivating stories and fairy tales that have been made into movies. I don't know what your movie collection looks like, but ours has quite a few of the Disney films in it. And of course, since we had all girls, quite a few of the Disney ones that are more aimed at young ladies. Uh, some great movies indeed. We've enjoyed Cinderella and Little Mermaid, and Toy Story and Mulan. One of my favorite of all time is uh, Beauty and the Beast, and maybe it's one of your favorites as well. Have you ever wondered what would have happened to the Beast if the Beauty had not appeared? What would have happened to the Beast? You remember how the story goes. Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince and an elaborate palace, but all of that was before the curse before the shadows fell on the castle of the prince, before the shadow fell upon the heart of the prince. When the darkness fell, the prince went into hiding. Secluded in the castle, he was left with an ugly snout and an even uglier mood. But all that changed. All that changed when the girl showed up. What would have happened to the beast if the beauty hadn't come. Better yet, what would have happened to the beast if the beauty didn't care? And who would blame her if she hadn't cared, right? I mean, after all, the beast was indeed a beast. He was ugly and hairy and angry and frightening. And she was such a beauty. So attractive. So gentle. So courageously and contagiously kind. And if ever two people lived up to their names, didn't the beauty and the beast. And so none of us would have blamed her if she didn't care, right? But she did. And because the beauty loved the beast, the beast became more beautiful himself. And that story is so familiar, not just because it's a fairy tale, not just because Disney's turned it into a couple of films, but because it reminds us of something, right? It reminds us of what we've seen happen in the lives of people over and over again. The story reminds us of ourselves. I'm in debt to Max Licato in his book, uh, He Chose the Nails, for his use of this illustration in illustrating the crucifixion of Jesus. There is a beast within each one of us. It wasn't always that way. There was a time when humanity's face was beautiful and the palace was pleasant, but that was before the curse. 
That was before the shadow fell across the garden of Adam, across the heart of Adam. And ever since the curse, things have been different. Sin has entered the world, and sin has entered into our lives. And sin causes us to be beastly. Sin causes us to be ugly and defiant and angry. And we do things we know we shouldn't do. And we wonder why we did them. Understand what I'm talking about? That ugly part of me shows itself at different times. Sometimes it surfaces when I'm driving, believe it or not. Somebody cuts me off, and the beast comes out. Sometimes it surfaces when I'm tired. And I'm frustrated. Other times it surfaces when I'm tempted by lust or selfishness or pride. Now, now sometimes when it surfaces, I'm able to keep it in its place, keep it under control. But not all the time. Other times when it surfaces, I give over control to it, let it have its way, and it's ugly. As I look at this battle with sin in my own life, I have to declare what Paul declared in Romans 7 and verse 15, and then later in verse 24, when he said, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What a wretched man I am. If you can identify with those words, then you're in good company. Paul isn't the only person in the Bible who wrestled with the beast within. It's hard to find a page in Scripture where you don't see someone struggling against sin. Cain killed Abel. You remember that? Noah got drunk. Abraham lied. Moses disobeyed. The nation of Israel doubted. King Saul chased after David with a spear. David committed adultery and murder. Herod slaughtered Bethlehem's toddlers. And then later, another Herod murdered Jesus' cousin John for no good reason. And if the Bible's called the good book, it's not because its people are all that good. The evil works of the evil one are so prevalent in the past and in the present. The devil is busy at work every single day, and he was busily working the day when Jesus was crucified. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the disciples were first of all fast asleep, and then they were fast afoot. They deserted Jesus in his moment of need. And then we see Herod wanted a show, right? He wanted to see Jesus do a miracle. And then we see Pilate just wanted out. Just let me wash my hands of this whole thing. And the soldiers, all they wanted was blood. The soldiers scourged Jesus that day. And the whip they used consisted of leather straps with pieces of metal or glass attached to the end. And the goal of the punishment was simple. Beat the accused within an inch of death and then stop. Thirty-nine lashes were allowed, but they were seldom needed. And a soldier was in charge of monitoring the prisoner's status. No doubt Jesus was near death when they finished his flogging. And that's likely why he, fell, why he fell under the weight of the cross as he carried it up the road to Calvary. Now there were actually three horrible things done to Jesus at the hands of the soldiers that day. First was the whipping, the flogging, the scourging. And the last was the crucifying. No, I didn't skip the one in the middle. We'll get to that in a second. Crucifixion, as you know, was an especially cruel form of execution. With beheading and with stoning, at least death comes quickly, right? But not so with crucifixion. The soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. They let him hang there until he died of exposure and suffocation. And so there he hung in pain for six hours. His muscles ached and spasmed. 
Don't you know those nails sent jolts of pain through his body with every movement? Surely his head pounded and his tongue cracked with dryness. Jesus died a miserable death. But we can't fault the soldiers for those two actions. They were just following their orders. But it's hard to understand what they did in between the flogging and the crucifying. The horrible thing that took place in between the other two was the humiliating. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's how Matthew describes what took place. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff. They struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe, put on his own clothes, put his own clothes on him, and then led him away to crucify him. So the soldier's assignment that day was simple. Flog him and crucify him. But the soldiers had another idea. They wanted to have a little fun in between the two. These strong, rested, armed soldiers encircled our exhausted and nearly dead Savior, and they bullied Him. The scourging and the crucifixion was ordered, but these actions were just plain cruelty. Why would someone draw pleasure out of spitting on a, head on a half dead man. Spitting and taunting are not intended to hurt the body, intended to degrade the soul or the spirit. What were these soldiers doing? They were elevating themselves at the expense of another. They made themselves feel big by making Christ look small. We've all likely done something similar to someone along the way. Haven't we? Maybe we've not physically spit on them, but maybe we've gossiped about them or slandered or somehow teased or bullied them. We've made someone feel bad so that we could feel good. That's what the soldiers did to Jesus. They whipped him, they humiliated him, in the end they crucified him. That's the suffering Jesus experienced at their hands. But what I want us to come to grips with today is the fact that although his suffering came through their hands, it was our sins that made it necessary. Why did he go through all that suffering? Why didn't he defend himself? Why didn't he bring his suffering to the end? Why did he endure it all? And the answer is because we are sinners. And our sin needed to be atoned for. Sin must be punished. The guilty party must pay the price unless an innocent person is willing to take their place. It was my sin and your sin that led to Jesus' flogging and taunting and dying. Now, it's hard for us to come to grips with this, isn't it? We, we want to say... But I'm really not so bad, right? Especially when I compare myself with others, then I look a lot better, right? It's kind of like the, what the pig might think as he sits there in the pig pen with his friends. And he looks around and he says, well, I'm, I'm as clean as everybody else. Or maybe I'm even a little cleaner than everybody else. But compared to most humans... Pigs need help. Compared to God, all humans need the same. The standard for sinlessness is not found on a pig pen here on earth, but at the throne of God in heaven. God himself is the standard, and we all fail the test. Scripture says it very plainly. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Isaiah 53, 6, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. 
Who can understand it? Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. And then verse 23, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Truth is, we are sinners. In Romans 6.23, and the wages of sin is death. Truth is, there is no hope for us except through Jesus. But here, the correlation with the beauty and the beast ends. In the fable, in the story as you know, beauty kissed the beast. And everything was transformed. But in the Bible, the, the beauty does so much more. The beauty becomes the beast. So the beast can become the beauty. Jesus changed places with us. And Paul says it this way in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Isn't it amazing that Jesus would still love us in spite of our sin? Isn't it amazing He would love us in spite of the ugliness of that beast that is within each of us? And isn't it astonishing that the Son of God would love us enough to allow the whip to hit His back and the spit to land on His face and the nails to pierce His hands and feet and the spear to open His side? How marvelous to realize the sinless one took on the face of the sinner so that we sinners can take on the face of a saint. And as awful and beautiful is the crucifixion story, it doesn't end with Jesus on the cross. As you know, after Jesus died on the cross that Friday afternoon, 2,000 years ago, His body was taken from the cross, placed in a brand new borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And that Friday evening, the Sabbath began. And it was the Passover Sabbath. And every good Jew gathered for the Passover meal and rested during the whole day of Saturday. And that's why the story of Jesus and His disciples doesn't pick up again with a new development until Sunday morning. And the Bible continues the story with these words. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow, and the guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. I want us to consider for just a minute through the crucifixion and resurrection, God has given us some amazing opportunities. And the first of those opportunities is the crucifixion and resurrection allow us to receive. I wonder what the two Marys were thinking about on the way to the tomb that Sunday morning. I know what they were not thinking. They were not thinking that they would find an empty tomb and a resurrected Jesus. That's not what they were thinking, right? They didn't say, hey, what are you going to say when you see Jesus alive? That's not what they were thinking. Mark's Gospel tells us exactly what they were thinking. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? Mark 16, 3. They were discussing what they were going to do when they got to the tomb, and that the tomb stone would not be moved when they got there. They had no idea the grave had already been vacated. You see, on Friday, all their hope died. 
when Jesus died. They were walking to the tomb with heavy hearts and with heavy hands full of spices. They had come to place warm oil on a cold body, pay their last respects. These two women were going to the grave to give, not to receive. These two women are the type of people who are willing to give to Jesus, expecting nothing in return. After all, someone had to anoint the body. And Peter and Andrew and John and the other apostles, they had not volunteered to do it. And so the women went to the tomb to give their gift of love. And I wonder what would have happened if on the way one of the Marys said to the other Mary, what's the use of this? We're going to get to the tomb, and how will we remove the stone? This is ridiculous. Let's just go home. What would have happened if they would have said, let's just go home. There's nothing we can do here. There's no reason to go. They would have missed the opportunity to receive. To receive the good news spoken by an angel. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. And you and I come today. And we get to receive that same good news. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Second, the crucifixion and resurrection allow us to believe. The scripture said there was an earthquake. Just as the earth shook when Jesus died, there was a violent earthquake when he arose. And the angel came from heaven, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. And I love that part of the story, don't you? He rolled it back and he sat on it. Like there. His countenance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. He was sitting on the one obstacle that stood in the way of the women and the tomb, right? The angel was sitting victorious atop the single greatest problem they thought they had that morning. And this elite group of Roman guards were so afraid. They were like comatose men, right? They thought this was going to be an easy assignment. I mean, just, just stand guard over this tomb for a couple of days. Why? To keep some fishermen and some women from stealing the body. That's a pretty easy assignment, don't you think? It's ironic. The one who had been dead was alive. And the ones who were alive were acting like dead men. But why did the angel roll the stone away from the tomb? For whom did he roll the stone away from the tomb? Maybe you thought, well, he rolled it away for Jesus so Jesus could get out. Now, Jesus didn't need the stone moved, right? He's the one who turned water into wine. He's the one who fed the multitudes. He's the one who healed the sick and gave sight to the blind and made the lame walk and commanded demons and walked on water and calmed the storm and raised the dead. And he's the one who can walk right through locked doors. Did he need the stone moved for him? No. The angel didn't move the rock for Jesus. He moved the rock away for the women and for us. Notice verse 6 when the angel said, Come and see the place where he lay, where, where he had been laid, right? The stone was not moved so Jesus could be let out, but was moved so the woman could be let in, so they could see and Believe. And the tomb remains open, right? And empty, so that we might believe. And then finally, the crucifixion and resurrection allow us to live without fear. They were instructed by the angel to go tell the disciples, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the angel told the women, do not be afraid. And Jesus would later tell them and the disciples the same thing. Do not be afraid. Because Jesus and the angel knew there were some men who were even more afraid than these women that morning. The disciples had gathered behind the locked doors because of fear. But when they got to see Jesus alive, Fear would be driven from their lives. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything. That band of self-centered, unreliable followers was transformed into kingdom-minded, fearless evangelists. 
How else can you explain the whiplash change in those men, right? I mean, they went from being scattered like rats on a sinking ship to men who would turn the world upside down with their preaching, willing to give their lives in martyrdom, proclaiming what? Faith that Jesus is risen from the dead. The resurrection can have that same kind of transforming power in our lives. Because what happened on Resurrection Sunday over 2,000 years ago, we don't have to be afraid. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says it like this, Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So we can live a life without fear. We can go to work without fear. We can go to school without fear. We can go to the doctor's office or the funeral home or to the grave. And we can go without fearing because Jesus is alive and well. What should a person do when they've been offered such an awful, beautiful gift like the crucifixion and resurrection? Such gifts must be received, first of all, with utter and endless thanksgiving. Imagine how you would feel toward the person who gave you a bone marrow transplant when you were next to death. You'd be humbled by the fact that he or she would put themselves at such risk and in such pain just for you. and You'd forever be thankful for their sacrifice. A day would not go by without you giving thanks for the person who gave something to save your life. And such should be our ongoing response to Jesus. Humility and thankfulness. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves and at an awful price to himself. In addition to receiving the gift of God with utter humility and endless thanksgiving should be a determination to offer our lives in God's service in return. If someone saved your life, wouldn't you want to make sure your life counted for something good? You wouldn't want that person thinking they'd wasted their effort on you or your life had not been worth saving, right? Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 5, and this was our scripture reading for today. For Christ's love compels us. And we could insert in there, for Christ's crucifixion and resurrection compel us. That's Christ's love in a nutshell, right? For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. A devoted life to God must show signs of God's influence. There ought to be an ongoing transformation as God is sanctifying us by His Spirit, as we take on more and more of the nature of God, and sin is no longer our master. There ought to be an increasing usefulness as an instrument of righteousness for God, as His Word equips us for every good work. And so where do you find yourself today? Have you come to grips with the beast within? Or has he still got a hold on you? Are you still a, a, a prisoner and slave to sin? Or have you been set free by our beautiful Savior and His awful sacrifice and His glorious resurrection? Have you received God's gift with humility and thanksgiving? Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, was told there in Acts 22, 16, this is how you receive the gift of God. Get up! Be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord, right? So having received God's awful, wonderful gift, are you determined to be an instrument of righteousness? Jesus gave his life for you. What have you given for him? There's not a more important question than that one for each one of us to answer, is there? He gave his life for you. He was crucified and resurrected for you. What are you going to do with that? If you need to talk with someone about what to do with that, we'd be glad to talk with you after this service or in the next week.
We'd love to share more about the story of Jesus and what God can do and will do in each of our lives.